Welcome back. You're watching Stock Watcher with me, Nolutandom Tonti Mlambo, and joining me to take your stock related questions tonight are Grant Nader from Benguela Global Fund Managers and Dickus Combrink from Cabicroft. Please uh, be sure to send your questions on email at stockwatch at bdtv.co.za or via SMS to 41392 or on X using the hashtag Stockwatch. Gentlemen, good evening. Hello. There's quite a lot to get through today. I want to start with the first one. Uh, please, could it's from Alan Cook. Please, could your panel discuss the prospects for Equitas? Uh, it is a truly bombed out share value out there. Let's talk about this one. Uh, Equitas Grant. Yeah, I still think it's a good business. So they obviously focus largely on logistics uh, and these large, you know, they service the, the large corporates, the shop rights of the world. Uh, they've got a solid business. I think they had some troubles in the UK in the, and they moved into kind of... Um, developmental focus and uh, I think they're focusing again they're refocusing refo on their core business um, I think it's a good little business I think it doesn't have the same growth prospects uh, in the near term that that some of the other um, types of property sectors have but uh, you're not going to go wrong in the long term with this one is my perspective mm -hmm. they've got long-term leases decent yield uh, and it's a higher quality business relative to some of the others that's my view and Drickus, what do you think of Equitas? Uh, is this one you also like? Yeah, it's just I think it's uh, the performance of Equitas is more related to the sector's woes. You know, um, REITs has, have been in property in general has been out of favour for the last few years. So we're seeing a recovery there. I think it's reaching an inflection point. Uh, even office uh, space is reaching an inflection point globally. We see um, um, rent is coming back into the market um, globally. And... Um, well, that shouldn't affect it just too much. But in general, I think it's just the property market was bad. And uh, this is a, one of, I think, one of, not a, one of the, uh, or one of the better players um, and a better part of the market. Um, it's sitting on a, on a nice yield. Um, yeah, I haven't got a problem with somebody holding it. I just prefer some other um, REITs in the sector mm -hmm. than, uh, than this one. Which ones? You've both said this now. So which ones do you both prefer? <laughs> Trickers, we'll start with you. Well, I think there's a bit of a more of a recovery in in some of the um, some of the retail and office names. Mm -hmm. So we we own well. <laughs> if you, if you want want to go for a for a real bombed out one on one that's sitting at a very high uh, cash flow yield or free cash flow yield, it's Octodeck. Um, I have to have a bit of hair on your teeth, but Octodeck is sitting at a 17, 18 percent. Um, uh, uh, Yield. Um, they obviously only pay 75% of that out, and only about 75% of the space is, is rented out. So there's some real catch up they can do. Obviously, some of the buildings they have will, well, I don't know if they ever get rented out. Some of them are in CB, on CBD Johannesburg and Pretoria. So uh, I'm not sure that gets rented out ever. Um, but there's definitely some recovery coming through there. Um, and then we own some high quality. I still like the Western Cape one spear. And, um, uh, and they're getting more diversified. Very small one, of course, but as they grow, obviously, um, the, the, the bed office cost gets less of a problem. And Grant, mm -hmm. any other uh, REITs that you're looking at besides Equitas that you might like? Yeah, I think some of those that have a little more gearing in terms of the, the actual fundamentals underlying the business. So perhaps... Uh, and even, uh, well, one that I, I think is really good quality is Nepi. Uh, I know that it's really Eastern Europe, but it's a fantastic business. Uh, and I think they're going to see an improvement in this rate cycle as well. And then, you know, locally you've got Vukile. I like their retail property portfolio. Yes, they've got a bit of Spain and whatnot in there. So there's a few things that are worth looking at. And if you want to play the prop, the office space, as Trick has said, that could be bottoming out. Then you can look at a growth point or one of those. So... Um, yeah, there's a couple that maybe give you a little more excitement in terms of potential. Uh, and I thought the next one, it's not a question, it's a comment. I know because it says hectic at the end. It says the JSC Osha Index still has a very long way to go with many record highs to follow in the coming months and maybe even years. 
hectic. Um, it's a nice statement. <laughs> yeah, let's 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 talk about this. You know, uh, is it is it like that? Is it hectic? Do we still have a lot of uh, up, 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 um, upside for uh, the local market, Drickers? Well, I, I don't see the local market as one market. It's a, it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. So mm. I think in general you can you can slice our market into a few uh, slices. It's the one part is very China dependent, and that is you know your your Richmonds and Nasdaqs etc. Um, you, we've got another multinational in there, uh, British American Tobacco. Obviously, you, maybe you can lump that with the multinational brand edges. But then you've also got your commodity producers. That's that's a different story, different fundamentals there, different drivers. And obviously, there's two different ones. We've got the the, the, the diversified Anglers, but it's in Glencore. Um, and then we've got your PGMs and your gold miners. Obviously, two different you know sets of um, uh, earnings drivers there. Um, we can't lump them all together. So is there certain areas that will go on to new hours? I think, yes, eminently SA Inc., the one that I've not mentioned, uh, our local food producers and manufacturers uh, with you know some of the transnet issues being sorted out, some of the, um, obviously, ESCOM being, um, you know, having that load shedding quite a while, maybe never, let's all thumbs. Um, I think there's a lot of upside. I think we're looking at a declining interest rate profile, uh, at least for now. And um, and our interest rate differentials, or our inflation, sorry, our inflation differentials with the rest of the world has actually, I think, structurally narrowed. Um, so I think for the next 10 years, we might, if we, if we don't score any own goals, you know, that's the caveat, um, we might see a stronger rand. No? Um, we're not going to depreciate it at at four percent per annum against the US dollar. It's going to be much a much closer game, and that will benefit local local stocks. You know your local economy stuff, banks, retailers, included in those that I've already mentioned. So I think those will go on to make new highs or at least recover. To some of them haven't seen highs for at least a few years. You know, and and they might recover some of that. And next question here. Thank you for that one. Drickus is from Stock Lord Grant. Uh, we think SA banks are good, but what do we make of APSA and what seems to be a leadership crisis? I think this following through from the numbers we got today and also the news uh, that we got today when we think of SA banks. So we often say they're a great bunch. Uh, but APSA, where are we there? I mean, they've, they've really struggled the last couple of years. They got their timing wrong uh, through the rate cycle, through the loan book cycle. You can see they opened the taps a couple of years ago and through the at the worst point in time while the other banks were being conservative they grew their loan book they're still paying for that now they've got high credit loss ratios and and they're they're trying to just sort of manage that book down again in addition to which you have to ask with the ceo leaving they just had a, a, a very capable cfo be appointed at netbank as ceo so there was clearly no succession planning or foresight so yes i think the management there is in disarray i, I don't like what i'm seeing However, the SA banks are a real nice little little oligopoly, and I think APSA will do well despite itself. It is cheap. I think it's like six and a half, seven times earnings. You're getting an 8% plus dividend yield. And as the economy improves, which I'm, I'm fairly sure it will, well, I have a strong view that it will, APSA will benefit from that given it's, it's so cheap and given that the banks are such a natural, it's not so closely tied to the to the economy. So whether that's the best bank to buy is a second question, is a different question, but I think ABSA will be fine for investors uh, despite themselves at this point in time. Drake, I'm also keen to get your thoughts on this one, I guess, because also it's so current, right? It's literally today's news. <laughs> no, I'm st still ongoing and uh, not only that, I think there's, there's some permanent brand damage being done. I, I don't buy turnarounds. I will, I'm not touching pick and pay. Uh, you know, I might be wrong, but 70 to 80 percent of turnarounds um, just never, you know, turn around. So I've, I've burnt my fingers with a lot of turnarounds in my my short career, mm -hmm. and um, I've learned to stay away from them unless you've got some, you know, some insights that the general market does not have. You know, just stay just stay away. The chances, you know, are are against you. The probabilities are against you if you, if you go for turnarounds. Not not that Apps is in any trouble, you know, um, but it's. I think it's going to stay, a, 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 the business is going to lag the rest of the sector um, unless there's some very strong leadership coming in.
Very interesting there. We also have a question from Ron, and he says it's very difficult to make decisions around equities right now. Small caps offshore. So the offshore question actually comes up twice because later on, Greg asks for what we think is foolproof stocks also looking offshores. Maybe let's talk about uh, offshore equities um, and maybe focusing on the US, uh, maybe some of those uh, European counters there. Uh, what do we make of the story right now, specifically of where we are in the interest rate cycle? We have seen some earnings emerge from the US. Some were okay, some were disappointing. It actually is quite a mixed bag, isn't it, Grant? Yeah, it is indeed. And but I think the US economy is doing okay. There have been some, there are some fears, but if you just look at it, Inflation continues to trend down and uh, the economy is not falling out of bed. The consumer is slowing, but the demand is still there. If you look at what Walmart was saying last week, they're OK. And if we start heading into a rate cutting cycle, that will provide a, a reasonable amount of support. So I think you should all have some global exposure and some local exposure. So the question around should you have offshore, the answer is definitely yes. Um, in terms of allocation, you should definitely have in every portfolio some diversification, some global. The large caps at the moment are still capturing the majority of the profits, the majority of the margin growth, and small caps have a much more geared balance sheet. But having said that, if we start seeing a reasonably decent rate cutting cycle, that should benefit the small caps relatively more because they are more sensitive to debt and changes in interest rates. So typically, um, the small caps might see a period of outperformance if we go through you know, a decent rate cutting cycle. But fundamentally, the large caps are operating really well at the moment. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh, I need to be a small cap or I need to be a large cap. Just look at the company that you want to buy. Do the fundamentals make sense? Does the growth prospect make sense? And is the quality there? And then you can buy it regardless of the market cap. Mm -hmm. And Rick, is your thoughts on this one, issues around equities? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll I'm very agnostic as to what you know, small or large cap. I'm, I'm, I'm market cap agnostic. Um, two of our biggest positions: um, one is Burford, and other one is Cameco. Um, that performed quite well the last few years. Both are relatively small in terms of market cap, but both of the leaders in the industry, um, and both have pristine balance sheets, so um, run by excellent management. So. You know, the market cap doesn't necessarily say anything about the quality of the investment. Um, but in general, yes, um, you know, small caps tend to be more um, more risky. Um, but it's that's that's only it's a general rule that's that I won't apply um, uh, too much. And um, the problem is with the US, the, the, the environment has suited large caps. That is that is starting to change a bit. Um, so I do see an environment where where not necessarily about the market cap. There are large businesses um, in, a, in a very tight regulatory environment benefits. But um, I see the, a changing of the guard where, where tech doesn't necessarily lead the market for the next decade, with other industries. I'm not sure which yet. We have our bets on, but I, I'm not sure which one of those comes out on top. And I, I think other ge geographies uh, than the U.S., wins out over the next 10 years than generally just U.S. large cap. Sure, we, we own some U.S. large cap stocks, but we, we are very much underweight. Quite a few uh, t uh, questions to still get through. We have one from Greg. Greg would like to find out about Nike. Is this a good time to buy Nike or other athleisure shares? Very interesting, actually. Uh, Grant, let's go with you on this one. So, yeah, thank you. It's, it's an interesting question. And I think if you, if you follow the activist investors, Nike looks interesting because Bill Ackman, who is a fantastic investor, has taken a stake in that recently. Um, having said that, there's a number of good athleisure companies. There's a couple of ones in China, Anta, Li Ning, those are great businesses. Um, there's also Lululemon, which has had a good pullback. Um, so Nike's been through this before. They're losing, they're losing a bit of market share. They're struggling with margin. Um, they've, they've pushed too hard into the direct-to-consumer, and now they're trying to, to rebuild that, that um balance of the wholesale distribution as well. So I think it's a it's a good business. I think it, the turnaround doesn't happen overnight, though. I think if you buy it, you need to be patient. So to be short, uh, I think you can buy Nike. There's a couple of others I think you could also buy, such as Lululemon, which I think has better prospects, to be honest, uh, or even Anto, that looks like a very nice business as well. Um, the space itself at Leisure, 
strong structural growth trend. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. So that's in your favor. Um, and yeah, but I think if you buy them, you also need to understand it is more cyclical than other types of businesses. So you're going to go up and down with the economic cycle and the consumer. Um, and then you need to be patient because Nike is in a turnaround phase. They're, they're struggling at the moment. I think they'll turn the business around, but be patient with it. All right, it's an interesting one indeed. Let's talk master drilling now. Uh, Anonymous says, what happened to master drilling? I thought they were a foolproof company, but now it's all talks of impairments and write downs. Yeah, never heard of a foolproof company in my life. Um, <laughs> but um, even Berkshire Hathaway had 50% drawdowns along the way. So, um, and, and the years of underperformance. Um, so, yeah, the, the term blue chip is one of the most dangerous chip terms maybe in, in, in investing. But yeah, um, I, I think it's a nice little business. There. I've been a long-suffering shareholder now for many years, small part of the portfolio. Um, but... And, and, and the business has, has not done badly. Um, operating profit grows at um, low double digits uh, compounded over the last few years. They've bought up some of their competitors. I think they're one of the, the if not the biggest race board drillers, you know, uh, in that niche market you know, on the planet. And um, the problem is just two of the end markets or, or the one most important one, PGMs, have done fairly, you know, poorly. Look at the PGM prices. And um, that I think at one stage was 30 or 40 percent of the business, if not more, at, at, at an earlier stage. And obviously, you know, they're cutting back on on capex and opex, and um, they would be, you know, that that would have flown into the revenue line for for Mastral. Unfortunately, one of you know the sectors that they then one of the other sectors as well, I can't remember which one, is also struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an opportunistic write-down. The machines haven't gone that they've written down. They can still use them in, in, in the future. It's not impossible. Uh, even if they, um, you know, it's possible to sell those machines, etc. I, I think it's overzealous to write them down. It's almost like the Sassel write-downs that we had last week. I think it's opportunistic. New CEO coming in, etc. So I think they've cleared the balance sheet and ROEs, etc. Would, would look better going forward. But yeah, there is this little bit of this little bit of a problem in that they they cannibalizing their own equipment. They 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 um, they uh, they tec tec technologically advancing the old time, and they have to write down old equipment because the new stuff that they're producing is basically better than the old stuff. So that cannibalizing themselves themselves at, at to a certain extent that's a problem for me making all stuff redundant but looking forward at one stage they'll get so effective that it replaces a lot of your traditional mining um procedures and i think that's what they're looking for longer term very interesting indeed grant do you have any thoughts on master drilling i'm glad you asked trick us the question not me <laughs> It's not a company I know well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's brilliant. Let's move on now. Another banking question from CK. Standard Bank is the more expensive SA bank, are they? Uh, and uh, But they keep doing well. Is there upside there still, uh, Grant? Yeah, I still think there is. I think I think you, you really can't divorce the banks from the macro environment. We're sitting, where we sit now, we're seeing the, a better outlook for South Africa than we've seen in years. Yes, and as Drikas and I were saying earlier, it does depend on everything staying put and, and holding together. But the glue is this improvement. You've got load shedding, you've got rate cutting, you've got consumer confidence, you've got the government of national unity, you've got global inflation dis coming down. There's so many factors. The outlook for South Africa is better than it's been in a long time. I think we're going to see upside surprises in growth and upward revisions. And Standard Bank is well positioned to that. So even though it's revalued and it's done really well, the earnings upgrades haven't even started yet. I think we're going to see earnings upside surprises, which again offsets some of the value. I think it's trading around nine times earnings. You're still getting a dividend yield of over 6%. Uh, to me, it still looks attractive, and I think it's actually cheaper than it looks just looking at the historic multiples. And then I'm um, keen to get your thoughts on uh, MTN. I think that's news of today. So I'll ask you both on this one. They're out today. This is a good business. Also from CK, this question. But shouldn't they leave Nigeria? This is a polarizing one. Uh, you know, uh, there I have to speak to some uh, commentators who will tell me that actually Nigeria is a kind of part and parcel of this business. It's still a good business. And some uh, say I'll completely avoid it because of uh, territories like Nigeria. I'm actually, uh, Drigas, let's hear your thoughts on this one. Yeah, sure. I think it's bad timing to exit Nigeria at the moment. I think Nigeria's uh, 
authorities have done uh, done a lot of hard work, swallowed a lot of bitter medicine to you know free throw that currency. I think um, that's the prudent thing to do. It was um, was bad um, for the last say twelve months or so. Um, and uh, too many companies are talking about exiting Nigeria. Obviously, there's other issues as well in Nigeria. The regulatory wise, there's some always some kind of tax shakedown happening. Um, <clears throat> which, but I think most of the, those are behind for MTN, um, and they've had this runaway inflation, obviously, but because of the currency, so it's difficult to um, appraise the, the results. The problem is with a company like MTN. You know, it's it's kind of like a, a, it's it's a utility without the pricing power of a utility. Um, in that that revenue, revenues can't really keep up with inflation. It lags it, but then it does catch up off the inflation subsides. So inflation is subsiding in that part of the world, and you know they have some catch up to do revenue wise. And I think the Nigerian results may surprise in in the coming two or three years if that region stabilizes. Interesting indeed. Grant, your thoughts on, I, on uh, MTN in Nigeria? Yeah, I think Trick has summed it up well in terms of timing. But what I will say is I don't think it's a fantastic business. I don't see this telco space as a good place for anybody to operate in this. There's no growth. It's heavily capex intensive and they don't have pricing power. There's a lot of headwinds and it's a very difficult industry and I, I don't really see what the upside is. Unless you think you can buy cheap enough to see some sort of revaluation and then sell it. But long term, it's not a sector I like and, and it's not a sector I would stay a long term investor in unless something fundamentally changed. And I mean, staying with this one, I guess, so they've got that uh, fintech business that seems to be, uh, you know, really gaining ground, working towards a spin off at some point. A grant that not in enough for the investment case? Uh, with, uh, with the fintech piece? Yes. I mean, they've. The fintech piece has been talked about for years and years and years, and I've, I've yet to see the value materialize, you know, meaningfully. I, there is some value there, but at the same time, value is being destroyed in other parts of the business. So, um, you know, I, I, I think there better. I think there are better places to to invest. There are better fintech operations to invest in. I could be wrong. I'd like to be wrong. I know Africa is highly fintech focused. Um, well, there's a lot of companies playing in that space, though. It's very competitive. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to see the, the proof of the pudding at scale before I get excited. Got you there, Grant. Let's talk Alibaba now. Uh, Anonymous says that Alibaba missed first quarter revenues, but I saw retail sales up in China. What's going on there now? Is there money to be made in Chinese stocks right now? Drukas, I'll, I'll get your thoughts too on this one, Grant. I think, Drukas, you also mentioned earlier that some of, uh, you know, lots of things tied to China's destiny. I think this certainly being one of them. How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> no, it's yeah. So on Alibaba, Alibaba looks dead cheap. We held this for a short while. Um, we've held the, the Chinese mainland index, index through, a, through a quantitative strategy for a short while. But the problem is with the Chinese is that they uh, they they're building a trade empire, um, and that necessitates them subsidising some of their companies and regulating others, and they basically um they've got targets uh, it's not not explicit but they've implicitly got target returns that these companies can earn target um target margins etc and they're not going to allow these companies to over earn um so it's the normal rules of capitalism does not apply and at the moment though, i think it's also a cyclical problem and um, mm -hmm. a lot of um portfolio investments have left china a lot of chinese investors have invested broadly and i do think there will be the cycle will turn for them sometime or another and then they will outperform the rest of the world but that doesn't change the structural problems that they have and the structural problems are less economic they've also, also got a lot of debt by the way but the the real problem is that the the equity um the equity market will never really behave um like like we used to in in the west all right, well, we are uh, heading into our stock picks uh, part of the show today. So I'll start with you, Adrikas. Uh, which stock are you loving this evening? Uh, Clientel on the um, JCE. Now, Clientel is sitting at a double-digit dividend yield. It's, uh, you know, the, the results are due in a few days or a few weeks. And, um, you know, the balance sheet should already have access to a much better bond market. 
um, the other the, the share prices of the other insurers on our market are, as have already had quite a run. I think Clientel is lagging them at the moment. It's just cheaper one. Um, obviously not the best quality one. Sorry, that's that's uh, my humble opinion. Um, the the better run insurers out there. Um, uh, but um, I do see them um, trading at a better valuation than they are at the moment. And while you wait to get quite the dividend yield. Grant, which stock you loving today? Well, in a similar kind of theme, um, I'm going with Combined Motor Holdings. So it's an SA focused company that should benefit from the better RAND environment, the better. They are, they've got some great brands. They've got Suzuki, they've got Haval, they've got Sherry. You've seen these things all over the road. They, they're capturing market share at a rapid clip and they will benefit as the RAND strengthens. Um, it's a highly cash generative business. It's trading on six times earnings. It's got a dividend yield of around 11%. Um, and it's and it's you know it's a well-run good management team. It's a well-run business. They are the kind of company that will benefit um, as things improve in SA. So that's my pick, CMH. Well, James, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for Stockwatch this evening. Always a pleasure uh, having you on. That's all for tonight's Stockwatch. Thanks to our guests there, Grant Nader from Benguela Global Fund Managers, as well as Trickers Combrink from Capricroft. And we're back uh, with you uh, with the close after this. <laughs>